Hello, and welcome to the Mythical Mug Tavern. Tonight, we journey into a realm where nightmares come to life and the shadows hold untold horrors. In this chilling incursion through the depths of folklore, we unveil the darkest corners of mythology, where legendary creatures lurk in the shadows, waiting to prey upon the unsuspecting. If you enjoy our content, don't forget to like this video, and thank you for watching. Let's begin. The Night Hag, also known as the Old Hag, has woven itself into the fabric of human experience, transcending cultural boundaries and persisting through the ages. To understand the Night Hag, we must first peer into the shadows of history and folklore. This malevolent entity has manifested in various cultures, each assigning its unique moniker to the Nocturnal Tormentor. From the Germanic Alpdrucken to the Brazilian Pisadera, the Night Hag is a universal spectre, haunting the collective nightmares of humanity. The Night Hag is often depicted as a wraith-like figure, cloaked in shadows, with long, bony fingers that reach out to grip the very soul of its victims. Its eyes, pools of darkness, reflect the terror it instills in those who lay eyes upon it. The creature's presence is heralded by a suffocating atmosphere, an otherworldly chill that seeps into the bones of its unsuspecting prey. As for its behavior, the Night Hag is a cunning and stealthy adversary. It prowls the twilight hours, seeking vulnerable souls ensnared in the clutches of sleep. It delights in inducing sleep paralysis, rendering its victims helpless as it perches upon their chests, feeding off the fear it instigates. The Night Hag possesses the power to infiltrate the dreamscape, manipulating the very fabric of reality within the realm of slumber. It is a master of illusion, tormenting its victims with nightmarish visions that blur the lines between dream and reality. Some even whisper of the Night Hag's ability to steal fragments of one's soul, leaving a mark that lingers long after the encounter. Alan is a deformed spirit with wings that grace the heavens and fingers that defy nature itself. Originating from Philippine mythology, the Alan are entities shrouded in mystery, dwelling near springs in houses adorned with the riches of the earth, crafted from gold and other treasures. But let not the allure of wealth deceive you, my friends, for these beings are not bound by material desires. Instead, they engage in a peculiar and unsettling practice, taking drops of menstrual blood, miscarried fetuses, afterbirth, and other reproductive waste to create their own version of life, human children nurtured under their ethereal wings. With wings that grant them the freedom of the skies, these spirits soar through the air with grace. However, their most unnerving feature lies in the anatomy of their extremities, fingers and toes that point backward, a macabre deviation from the natural order. Several Native American tribes from the western regions share eerie tales about mysterious beings known as water babies. While the narratives vary slightly, they commonly feature infant-like spirits haunting bodies of water, displaying either mischievous or malevolent tendencies. In a haunting account from the Shoshone tribe, water babies emerge from a tragic famine, where desperate mothers were compelled to drown their infants due to food scarcity. Filled with vengeful fury, these slain infants return to haunt the tribe's shores, luring unsuspecting victims to a watery demise. Similar stories emerge from tribes residing near Utah's Pyramid Lake, where deformed or ailing infants were cast into its depths to alleviate tribal burdens. However, these discarded infants transform into avenging creatures, targeting unsuspecting individuals, particularly white men, dragging them into the lake's abyss annually. Another variant of the Water Babies legend originates from the shores of Lake Utah in Provo, presenting these entities as mythical creatures, 
By mimicking the cries of human infants, they lure victims to the water, seeking to drown them. Despite the differing details, all these tales share a common admonition. Should one hear an infant's cry near the water's edge, caution is warranted. The tale of the chupacabra emerged from Latin American folklore, its name a chilling amalgamation of chupa, meaning sucks and cabras, denoting goats. The first whispers of this creature's bloodthirsty exploits echoed through Puerto Rico in 1995, and since then, it has cast its shadow across the continent, venturing as far as Chile and even venturing beyond the Americas into the realms of Russia and the Philippines. Descriptions of the chupacabra paint a vivid yet perplexing picture. In Puerto Rico, it takes the form of a reptilian behemoth, akin to an extraterrestrial heavyweight with a spine of spikes from neck to tail. Meanwhile, in the arid landscapes of the southwestern United States, it assumes a more canine guise, evoking the image of a fearsome dog-like predator. The chupacabra possesses a reputation steeped in the blood of livestock. It is said to prey upon goats and other domesticated creatures, draining them of their life essence. This creature's elusiveness, coupled with its reported vampiric tendencies, makes it a formidable adversary for any unsuspecting farmer or herder. The Banshee is often described as a female spirit or fairy, and her appearance varies in different accounts. In some tales, she is depicted as a beautiful woman with long, flowing hair and a white or grey flowing gown. Other descriptions portray her as a more ethereal figure, sometimes with red or flaming eyes, pale skin, and a sorrowful expression. Despite the variation, the Banshee is generally associated with an otherworldly and haunting beauty. The most distinctive characteristic of the Banshee is her mournful and piercing cry, often described as a wail or a scream. This keening cry is said to be an omen of death, signaling the imminent passing of a family member. The whale is believed to have a distinctive supernatural quality that sets it apart from the cries of ordinary mourning. The Banshee is often considered a harbinger of death, particularly within Irish folklore. Her primary role is to forewarn certain families, usually those with a strong Irish lineage of an impending death. The Banshee is especially associated with prominent or noble families, acting as a supernatural messenger sent to alert them to the imminent passing of a loved one. The Banshee is said to manifest herself in various ways, appearing near a family's home, particularly by water sources like rivers or lakes. Some accounts describe her washing the clothes or blood-stained garments of the person about to die. In other stories, she may be seen combing her hair with a silver comb, which is believed to be an ancient symbol of mourning. The Prita finds its roots in the ancient beliefs of Hinduism and Buddhism. Originally perceived as the soul and ghost of the departed, the concept evolved into a transient state, a purgatory, if you will, where the soul languishes in hunger and thirst, awaiting karmic reincarnation. These spectral entities are the remnants of individuals who, in their past lives, succumbed to vices such as falsehood, corruption, compulsion, deceit, jealousy, or greed. Cursed by their karma, Pretas are plagued by an unquenchable desire for a particular, often repulsive substance. In traditional lore, this might be cadavers or feces, though contemporary tales suggest a broader range of bizarre cravings. Coupled with these insatiable appetites, Pretas suffer from disturbing visions, perceiving the world through a lens of repulsion. In their ghostly form, Pretas are invisible to the naked eye, lurking in the same physical space as humans. They possess a hauntingly human appearance, with sunken, mummified skin, emaciated limbs, bloated bellies, and elongated, fragile necks. This imagery serves as a metaphor for their mental state, enormous desires restrained by the thin tether of satisfaction. Next, we venture into the frigid heart of North American folklore,
where the chilling winds of the Wendigo blow through the tales of the Plains and Great Lakes natives. This malevolent creature, born of Algonquian-speaking people's traditions, haunts the East Coast forests of Canada, the Great Plains and the Great Lakes region with its insatiable hunger and icy presence. The Wendigo, a creature that transcends the line between evil spirit and malevolent being, invokes a primal fear that echoes through the centuries. Its description varies, but the common thread is its association with greed, hunger, cannibalism, and the propensity for driving those it possesses to commit murder. Picture, if you will, the haunting words of Basil H. Johnston, an Ojibwe scholar, as he paints a vivid portrait of the Wendigo. Gaunt to the point of emaciation, desiccated skin pulled tightly over its bones, eyes pushed back deep into their sockets, lips tattered and bloody. A skeletal figure, resembling a corpse recently exhumed, emitting an eerie odor of decay and death. In the law of the Ojibwe, Eastern Cree, West Main Swampy Cree, Naskapi and Innu, the Wendigo takes on a colossal form, described as a giant, many times larger than a human. The creature's insatiable appetite is a central theme, for with every human meal devoured, the Wendigo grows in proportion, a grotesque manifestation of gluttony and starvation simultaneously. These creatures are winter's malevolent specters, tied to the north, coldness, famine, and starvation. The air carries a foul stench or a sudden, unseasonable chill before the Wendigo's approach, signaling the impending terror that awaits. Legends abound with tales of the Wendigo embodying the darkest aspects of humanity. Gluttony, greed, and excess, a never-ending cycle of consumption, and the ceaseless search for new victims. The Ahuizotl is often described as a water creature resembling a dog or a small wild animal. Its most distinctive feature is a long, flexible, and human-like hand at the end of its tail. This hand is equipped with sharp claws or talons, enabling the Ahuizotl to grasp and drag its prey into the water. Its body is typically covered in sleek fur, and it may have a sleek, aquatic appearance. The creature is often portrayed as having smooth, shiny skin, potentially reminiscent of a water-dwelling creature. The Ahuizotl's overall appearance is both eerie and adapted for its aquatic habitat. The Ahuizotl is said to inhabit bodies of water such as lakes, rivers, and canals. It is known for its cunning and predatory nature. The creature is said to lie in wait near the water's edge, using its long tail to reach out and grab unsuspecting victims that come too close to the water. The Ahuizotl is particularly associated with preying on those who venture into the water alone, such as fishermen, travelers, or children. Legend has it that the creature's favorite food is human nails, eyes, and teeth, which it supposedly extracts with its dexterous tail hand. The next creature, described as the nastiest of Scotland's Northern Isles demons by folklorist Catherine Briggs, is a blend of equine and human elements, a nightmarish manifestation that haunts the Isles with its icy breath and demonic form. Picture the desolation it brings, the knuckle of ease breath, a harbinger of doom, withering crops and sickening livestock. Responsible for droughts and epidemics, this demonic entity, despite being predominantly a sea dweller, casts its malevolence upon the land. In the tapestry of Orcadian folklore, the Knuckle of Ease appearance on land is a ghastly sight, its description varying among accounts. One brave islander, Tamas, recounted his confrontation with the beast, providing a rare first-hand account. Imagine this grotesque creature, a man's torso melded to a horse's back, arms reaching the ground, legs with fin-like appendages, and a head that rolls back and forth. Gruesome details abound. Two heads, one equine with a gaping, toxic mouth, and the other a man's head with a mouth projected like that of a pig. No skin adorns this horror, 
Instead, black blood courses through yellow veins, and pulsating sinews and muscles are visible. The knuckle of his breath, a poisonous vapor, wilts crops and spreads disease among livestock. It wreaks havoc, blamed for epidemics, droughts, and even the wrath of the elements. A peculiar connection arises with seaweed burning for kelp production, believed to enrage the creature and unleash its fury upon the islands. Yet fear not, for the mither of the sea, an ancient Orcadian spirit, holds the key to controlling this malevolent force. During the summer months, the Knuckle of E is confined by this mystical entity, allowing a respite from its terror. Additionally, the creature, like many of its kind, cannot tolerate fresh flowing water. A simple crossing of a stream becomes the escape route for those pursued by this monstrous entity. The Gulon is often described as a fearsome and monstrous creature, combining features of different animals. Its typical depiction includes the body of a cat, the head of an ox, and the hooves of a deer. Some accounts suggest that it has long, shaggy fur, while others describe it as having a sleek and glossy coat. The creature is generally portrayed as larger than an average cat, making it a formidable and intimidating presence. One of the defining characteristics of the Gulon is its insatiable appetite. It is said to have a voracious hunger and an ability to consume an immense quantity of food. Despite its monstrous appearance, the Gulon is often depicted as a cunning and elusive creature, able to outsmart hunters and escape capture. The Gulon is believed to be particularly fond of the taste of human flesh, adding to its menacing reputation. Its insatiable hunger and predatory nature make it a creature to be feared in Nordic folklore. The Gulon is said to inhabit dense forests and remote wilderness areas, adding an element of mystery and danger to these locations. It is often associated with the untamed and wild aspects of nature, reflecting the fears and uncertainties of ancient Scandinavian societies. The Sankai is a bizarre yokai born of maternal misfortune in Japanese mythology. Picture this, a creature born not out of the ordinary, but from the neglect of due care during pregnancy. When a mother-to-be fails to give the attention her condition demands, a Sankai emerges, a birth monster, a harbinger of maternal neglect. Legends of its appearance vary, yet the common thread weaves the creature into the semblance of cattle, a creature cloaked in hair. In Saitama and Kanagawa prefectures, it goes by the ominous moniker of Kekai, and in Nagano prefecture, it's known as Keke. Sparse tales paint its image, yet the hairiness and bovine characteristics persist. Tales, too, whisper of a sinister tactic. The Kekai burrows beneath the house to claim its mother's life. In Urawa, a practice arose, encircling the birthing grounds with Biobu, the protective folding screens, shielding against this stealthy assault. In the folklore of various Native American tribes, the enigmatic beings known as Stick People evoke fear and caution to the extent that their names are often left unspoken, lest one inadvertently summon or offend them. Referred to as Stick People or Stick Indians, these forest spirits are as varied in appearance as the tribes that tell of them. The Salish liken them to Bigfoot-like creatures, while the Nez Pierce envision them as diminutive beings. Despite these differences, all tales agree on one thing. The Stick people are characterized by their hot tempers and mischievous nature. Roaming the dense forests of the Pacific Northwest, Stick people are most commonly sighted under the veil of night. Known for their penchant for pilfering fish, clothes, and food, these elusive spirits derive amusement from poking sticks into teepees. Attempts to thwart or impede them often result in dire consequences, as stick people are infamous for their vindictiveness. Legend warns that even the smallest offense can provoke them to retaliate, driving individuals to madness, abduction, or worse, consumption. 
shape-shifting adds to the difficulty of evading stick people as they effortlessly assume the guise of wild animals to lure unsuspecting victims deeper into the woods. Their ability to mimic animal sounds or whistle further complicates avoidance strategies. Yet, it is their unwavering desire for vengeance that defines them most profoundly. No affront, however slight, escapes their memory, ensuring that those who incur their wrath face enduring consequences. In the shadowy depths of the forest, the presence of the stick people serves as a chilling reminder of the peril that awaits those who dare to cross them. Jiangxi are reanimated corpses that are often depicted as stiff, lethargic beings. Traditionally, they wear burial clothes which may be tattered and decayed. One distinctive feature is their mode of movement. Instead of walking, Jiangxi are said to hop with their arms outstretched. This hopping gait is both eerie and distinctive, adding to the creature's unsettling nature. Jiangxi are often portrayed with a pale, deathly complexion, sunken eyes, and long, disheveled hair. Some depictions also include talon-like fingernails or claws, which they use to attack and feed on the life force of the living. Jiangxi are known for preying on the life force or key of the living. In Chinese folklore, it's believed that the life force of the living sustains the Jiangxi, and they may drain this vital energy through physical contact. To navigate, Jiangxi hop rather than walk, and they are said to move at night, particularly during the Hong Ha hours, which are considered to be between 11 p.m. and 1 a.m. Jiangxi are often associated with the process of reanimation and may be reawakened through mystical or supernatural means, such as a necromancer's spell. Traditional Chinese folklore offers various methods to prevent or ward off Jiangxi. These include placing mirrors or talismans on the doors of homes, as Jiangxi are said to be afraid of their own reflections. Taoist priests may also perform rituals to repel or exorcise these creatures. In some tales, it's believed that Jiangxi are attracted to the breath of the living, and holding one's breath can be a way to avoid detection. Additionally, items like glutinous rice are said to repel Jiangxi, and scattering it in their path might impede their progress. In the Navajo tongue, Yi Nal Dlushi translates to, by means of it, it goes on all fours. A term shrouded in mystery and apprehension, it refers to a type of anti eni one of several varieties of skinwalkers within Navajo culture. These enigmatic figures possess the ability to transform into, possess or disguise themselves as animals, embodying a power that stands in stark contrast to the healing practices of Navajo medicine people. Navajo culture, deeply rooted in communal values and spiritual harmony, views witches, including skinwalkers, as the antithesis of their cultural ideals. While medicine men and women are revered for their positive contributions, witches are seen as agents of malevolence, wielding harmful ceremonies and manipulative magic that perverts the benevolent works of traditional healers. The legend of the skinwalkers is a tightly held secret within Navajo culture, not readily shared with outsiders. Reluctance to discuss the subject stems from both the sacred nature of the stories and a desire to preserve the cultural context in which they are embedded. Animals associated with witchcraft, especially tricksters like the coyote, play a significant role in skinwalker lore. These creatures may possess the ability to inhabit living beings, including humans, walking among the unsuspecting in borrowed bodies. Navajo children are sometimes privy to stories of life and death struggles between skinwalkers and their people, tales of encounters that may end in victory or stalemate. Originating from the saga of a beautiful queen of ancient Libya, Lamia's tale is one steeped in tragedy and revenge. Ensnared in a tumultuous affair with the mighty Zeus, Lamia suffered the wrath of Hera, losing her own children in a cruel twist of fate. 
Driven to madness by grief, Lamia, in vengeance and despair, turned to devouring innocent children, a chilling metamorphosis reflecting her inner torment. Lamia's once beautiful appearance was tainted by her heinous acts, transforming her into a half-woman, half-snake monster. Zeus, in an attempt to quell her ceaseless torment, bestowed upon Lamia the power of prophecy and the unsettling ability to remove and replace her own eyes, a perpetual reminder of her insomniac affliction and eternal grief. The Lamiae, offspring of this tragic tale, became nightmarish phantoms, infamous for seducing young men to satiate their desires and then feasting upon their flesh. One of the most chilling tales from Native American folklore revolves around Skudakumuch, also known as Ghost Witches. These malevolent spirits arise from the remains of evil sorcerers who refuse to stay dead. Instead, they unleash terror upon the living, indulging in acts of murder, consumption, and curses. Only fire has the power to extinguish them. In a haunting narrative passed down through generations of the Wabanaki tribe, the emergence of a Skudakumuch begins with the demise of a vengeful sorcerer. After his death, rumors spread of eerie occurrences in the depths of the forest where his body lay within an ancient tree. On a moonlit night, a couple ventures into this haunted domain, oblivious to the forewarnings. Despite his wife's trepidation, and the ominous shadows looming overhead, the husband presses forward, dismissing her unease. As night descends and the forest echoes with unsettling murmurs, the wife's senses prick with dread. While her husband slumbers, she remains vigilant, the silence broken only by a sinister gnawing. At dawn's light, a grisly sight awaits. The husband lies slain, his form mutilated, his heart torn asunder. Fleeing in terror, the wife seeks refuge with the Wabanaki tribe, recounting her harrowing ordeal. Initially met with skepticism, the tribe accompanies her to the cursed tree, where they uncover the sorcerer's remains and sense the lingering presence of the witch within. Confronted with this malevolent force, they turn to fire, hoping to purge the land of its terrors. Yet whether they succeed in banishing the Skudakumuch into the depths of oblivion remains a mystery shrouded in the mists of legend. The Kappa, also known as the River Child, lurks in the waters with its mischievous antics and peculiar weaknesses. Imagine, if you will, a creature resembling a green, human-like being with webbed hands and feet, adorned with a turtle-like carapace on its back. A unique feature, a depression on its head, known as the dish, retains water vital to the kappa's strength. Beware, for should this dish be damaged or its liquid lost, the kappa is rendered severely weakened. Kappa, as water kami, often engage in behaviors ranging from minor misdemeanors to outright malevolence. From peeking under women's kimonos to drowning people and animals, kidnapping children, and even engaging in acts as sinister as consuming human flesh, these creatures are not to be trifled with. Yet, despite their potentially menacing actions, Kappa may also display amicable behavior, befriending other yokai or even humans. The legends surrounding Kappa include accusations of assaulting humans in water and extracting a mythical organ called the Shirikodama from their victims' anuses. This organ, said to contain the soul, becomes the subject of dark deeds attributed to these mysterious beings. Now, let me share with you the means of defense against these elusive creatures. It is believed that Kappa are obsessed with politeness. If one were to make a deep bow, the Kappa, being courteous, would return the gesture, inadvertently spilling the water from its head. While in this vulnerable state, a person could escape or, if so inclined, refill the kappa's dish. By doing so, the kappa would become indebted to the person, serving them for all eternity. Another weakness involves the kappa's arms, easily detachable from its body. 
Should one manage to pull off an arm, the kappa would offer favors or share knowledge in exchange for its return. Additionally, challenges in shogi or sumo wrestling could be used to exploit the kappa's weaknesses, prompting it to spill the water from its dish. The mananangle, a word derived from tangle meaning to remove or to separate, is a gruesome entity deeply rooted in Filipino folklore. Imagine a creature, hideous and haunting, predominantly depicted as female, its distinguishing feature, the ability to sever its upper torso from its lower body. Picture this grotesque display, intestines trailing, bat-like wings unfurling, and a proboscis-like tongue ready to strike. The mananangal is a nocturnal predator with specific preferences. It preys on the unsuspecting, sleeping, pregnant women, and even newborns. Beware, ye grooms-to-be, for the jilted at the altar are prime targets of its sinister intentions. With a taste for fetuses and the blood of the slumbering, this creature embodies the nightmares of those who dare cross its path. Its ability to fly with those massive wings allows it to traverse the night swiftly. Yet, even in the face of such terror, there lies a chink in its armor. The severed lower torso, left standing, becomes the creature's Achilles' heel. Sprinkling salt, smearing garlic, or showering ash upon it proves fatal. The mananangle is susceptible to these earthly defenses, unable to rejoin its halves if these measures are taken. Remember, my fellow hunters, knowledge is the key to survival. The Krasue is typically described as a female spirit or ghost with a detachable, floating head and trailing internal organs. Only the head and the upper part of the body are visible, often depicted with long, disheveled hair and a ghastly, distorted face. The head is surrounded by a soft, glowing light, adding to the eerie atmosphere. The internal organs, including the heart, lungs and entrails, dangle beneath the head, creating a gruesome and unsettling image. In some variations, the Krasu is said to have sharp fangs or a long, prehensile tongue, which it uses to consume blood or flesh. The Krasu is believed to be a nocturnal creature emerging at night to satisfy its hunger. It is often associated with places such as graveyards, deserted areas, or remote villages. The Krasua is said to feed on animals, particularly livestock, and occasionally on humans, by using its sharp teeth or tongue to extract blood. Despite its horrific appearance, the Krasu is said to be a cursed individual rather than an inherently evil spirit. In some versions of the folklore, it is suggested that the Krasu was once a beautiful woman who became cursed due to her misdeeds or supernatural influences. One of the notable features of the Krasu is its ability to transform back into a normal-looking person during the day. In its human form, the Krasu appears as an ordinary woman, concealing its supernatural nature. This dual existence adds an element of mystery and danger to the folklore, as the Krasu can move freely among the living without revealing its true identity. In the lore of the Iroquois people, the spectral entity known as Oniate, or Dry Fingers, or Dry Hand, is a chilling manifestation of supernatural vengeance. Among the Seneca and Cayuga tribes, Oniate is believed to prowl desolate, abandoned areas, striking fear into the hearts of those who dare to venture near. In some versions of the legend, Oniart lies in wait, ambushing unsuspecting trespassers who wander into forbidden territories. However, another rendition portrays Oniate as a relentless seeker of justice, actively pursuing individuals who have committed wrongs. Those who speak ill of the deceased, sow discord within their tribe or family, or pry into others' affairs, risk invoking its wrath. Once Oniat deems someone deserving of punishment, it extends its diseased fingers, its touch capable of inflicting illness, blindness, or even death upon its victims. To some, Oniat serves as a cautionary tale, instilling a sense of moral responsibility in children. 
Fearful of Oniet's retribution, they are admonished to speak kindly of others, maintain harmony at home, and refrain from meddling in matters that do not concern them. Similar myths of ghostly appendages appear in folklore worldwide, such as the legend of La Mano Peluda in South America. This spectral hand is said to emerge from beneath beds, tormenting disobedient children who resist sleep. Across cultures, these eerie tales serve as reminders of the consequences of wrongdoing and the importance of moral integrity. The Notsnitsa, known by various names across the East Slavic languages, is a creature steeped in the history and folklore of the region. In Belarus, she's the Naknika, in Poland, the Noknika or Płaczka, and in Russia, the Noknitsa. This nocturnal tormentor is often depicted as a nightmare spirit or demon, with a penchant for unsettling encounters during the twilight hours. Legend has it that the Notsnitsa particularly targets children, invoking fear in the hearts of parents. Mothers, wise in their protective ways, resort to placing stones with holes in the center near their children's beds. This seemingly peculiar practice is said to ward off the Notsnitsa, for the creature is believed to be repelled by the mystical properties of such stones. Some even go so far as to place knives in their children's cradles or draw protective circles around them, relying on the age-old belief that supernatural beings shy away from the touch of iron. Now let's talk about the Notsnitsa's haunting appearance, a spectral figure perched on one's chest in the dead of night, drawing away the very essence of life. It's not just a creature of darkness, it's a nocturnal predator, a vampire in the shadows. Folklore warns that the Notsnitsa is drawn to those who sleep on their backs, hands resting on their chests, a position known, rather morbidly, as sleeping with the dead. The Notsnitsa, it said, is made of shadow, with a ghastly screeching voice that can chill the bones of even the bravest souls. Some claim she carries the scent of moss and dirt from her forest dwelling, adding an eerie dimension to her spectral presence. The Leshy is often depicted as a tall and humanoid figure, covered in shaggy, mossy or leafy hair that blends seamlessly with the surrounding vegetation. This camouflage allows the Leshy to easily blend into the forest environment. Despite its human-like appearance, the Leshy can vary in size from that of an ordinary person to a giant, towering figure. It is often portrayed with a greenish or brownish tint, further enhancing its connection to the forest. The creature's eyes are said to be piercing and glowing, reflecting its deep connection with the natural world. Some accounts describe the Leshy as having a beard made of grass or leaves, emphasizing its ties to the flora of the forest. The Leshy is considered the guardian spirit of the forest and is believed to be the master of all animals and birds within its domain. It is a shapeshifter, able to change its size and appearance at will. While generally benevolent towards animals and the forest, the Leshy can be mischievous or even vengeful if it perceives humans as a threat to the natural balance. One of the Leshy's notable traits is its ability to imitate the voices of people or animals, leading travelers astray or confusing them in the depths of the forest. It is said to have the power to create illusions and may use this ability to disorient or test the intentions of those wandering in its territory. The Leshy is generally portrayed as a protector of the forest and its inhabitants. In Slavic folklore, people believed that angering the Leshy could lead to misfortune, getting lost in the woods, or being plagued by supernatural occurrences. Some legends suggest that leaving offerings such as bread, milk, or tobacco in the forest could appease the Leshy and ensure safe passage through its domain. Despite its protective nature, the Leshy is known to kidnap humans, especially children, taking them deep into the woods. In such cases, it is said that the Leshy intends to raise the child as its own or teach them the secrets of the forest. The Mandarugo is a peculiar manifestation from Philippine folklore, similar to a vampire. By day, 
These creatures assume the guise of young and beautiful women, concealing their true nature with a veil of normalcy. As dusk descends, a profound transformation unfolds, revealing wings and elongated, razor-sharp tongues. Their nocturnal pursuits involve sanguine endeavors, be it through incisions on a man's neck or extracting blood through unsettling kisses. Picture it, a creature of deceptive charm, luring unsuspecting prey into its grasp. The Mandarugo embodies the duality of beauty and horror, a beguiling facade that conceals its true intentions. Legends, especially among Tagalog and Bikol speakers, depict them as cunning predators capable of weaving elaborate schemes such as marrying multiple times to sustain their insatiable thirst for blood. In the eerie depths of Choctaw legend lies the chilling tale of the long black being known as Nalosa Falaya, a malevolent entity that haunts the twilight woods with sinister intent. Described as humanoid with a withered face, small eyes, and elongated ears, this creature lurks near swamps, patiently awaiting unsuspecting hunters to cross its path. Mimicking human voices or swiftly darting across the trail, the long black being lures its prey into a false sense of security before striking. Upon rendering the hunter unconscious with a prick from a thorn or quill, it ensnares them in a bewitched trance gradually amplifying their mood from grumpy to violently aggressive. Under the influence of the long black being's curse, the afflicted hunter becomes compelled to commit acts of violence against those closest to them, spreading discord and destruction. Some accounts even attribute widespread death among the Choctaw tribe to the ominous presence of this malevolent entity, with sightings preceding calamitous events such as deadly epidemics. Despite its nefarious deeds, legend suggests that the long black being maintains its own twisted family, with tales of its offspring possessing the ability to detach their internal organs and float through the air, haunting the marshy edges as eerie specters of the night. In the shadowy realm of Choctaw folklore, the long black being casts a foreboding presence a harbinger of darkness and despair lurking within the twilight woods. A spectral hag, with her blue face and iron claws, has haunted the hills of Leicestershire for centuries. Legend has it, she dwells in a cave adorned with a sinister oak tree, a place known as Black Annis's Bower Close. Now, whether she truly exists, or if her origins are woven into the fabric of mythology, that's a question that keeps scholars and storytellers alike scratching their heads. Some suggest a link to Celtic or Germanic mythology, drawing parallels to goddesses like Danu or Hel. Others see reflections of an ancient mother goddess, a devourer of children akin to figures like Kali and Kailiach Pira. It's even been proposed that Black Annis could be a distorted memory of sacrifices made to a goddess during a bygone era. But hold your tankards, my friends, for Ronald Hutton offers a different brew. He argues that Black Annis might have been a real person, Agnes Scott, a medieval anchoress or nun who dwelled in the Dane Hills. According to Hutton, the legend could have arisen from a mix of local folklore, anti-anchorite sentiments during the Reformation, and a dash of Victorian-era confusion with the goddess Anu. Now let's turn our gaze to the more tangible aspects of this spectral crone. Picture her, if you dare, a blue-faced hag with iron claws prowling the night for children and lambs. She's said to tan their skins on that ominous oak tree, wearing them as grisly accessories around her waist. Her eerie howls could be heard miles away, prompting clever cottagers to build small windowed houses to keep her grasping hands at bay. As for weaknesses, well, the sound of her grinding teeth apparently served as a warning. Quick-thinking folks would bolt their doors and fortify their windows with protective herbs. Some even intentionally built cottages with small windows, allowing only a single arm's reach. A bit extreme, perhaps, 
but survival in the face of a flesh-hungry hag demands creativity. The Sigbin is a nocturnal predator from Philippine folklore that is said to prowl the realms of Visayas Islands and Mindanao, especially in the rustic corners where moonlight dances with the unknown. There's a fascinating speculation that the legend might trace its origins to actual encounters with a mysterious, rarely seen animal, perhaps a distant relative of the kangaroo that migrated from Australia eons ago. Imagine a creature that defies the conventional norms of motion. The Sigbin walks backward, head lowered between its hind legs. Resembling a hornless goat, it boasts unnaturally large ears that can clap like hands, and a whip-like tail that adds to its arsenal. The Sigbin is shrouded in the supernatural. It can render itself invisible, employing stealth with a chilling finesse. A creature that exudes a nauseating odor, adding an olfactory assault to its already fearsome presence. During Holy Week, it emerges from its lair, seeking the hearts of children which it fashions into amulets. This ritualistic malevolence implies a sinister intelligence, making the Sigbin a formidable adversary. The Mavka is often portrayed as a supernatural and alluring female spirit associated with nature. Her appearance is ethereal and captivating, with long, flowing hair and a slender figure. Mavkas are typically depicted wearing white or green garments made of leaves and flowers, blending seamlessly with the natural environment. One distinctive feature of the Mavka is her eyes, which are believed to be hypnotic and enchanting. Despite her captivating beauty, the Mavka is also associated with an otherworldly and somewhat eerie presence. The Mavka is closely tied to the natural world, particularly forests, meadows, and bodies of water. She is often associated with the spirits of trees and is said to dwell in areas abundant with vegetation. Mavkas are considered guardians of the forest and are believed to have a deep connection with plants and animals. Mavkas are nocturnal spirits and their activities are often associated with the night. They are known for dancing in moonlit clearings, luring travelers or young men into the depths of the forest with their mesmerizing dances. While Mavkas can be alluring, they are also known for their capricious nature, sometimes leading humans astray or causing mischief. In some legends, it is said that Mavkas can be vengeful if their forest homes are disturbed or if they are disrespected. They may play tricks on those who enter their domain or even lead them to their doom. The origin of the Mavka is often linked to tragic stories of young women who died prematurely or under mysterious circumstances. These spirits are sometimes believed to be the souls of unmarried girls who met untimely deaths, and their connection to nature reflects themes of both beauty and melancholy. The tale of the Gashadokuro finds its roots in the 10th century, a time of samurai clashes and familial vendettas. Taira no Masakado, a samurai of considerable repute, faced betrayal and sought vengeance, leading to a series of events that birthed this bone-chilling creature. Created by the powerful sorceress Takiyasha Haim, the Gashadokuro became an avenging force, wreaking havoc on Kyoto to avenge Masakado's death. The law weaves together historical events, sorcery, and the supernatural, creating a creature that embodies the wrath of the fallen. Gashadokuro is a colossal skeleton, standing over 10 meters tall, crafted from the skulls of fallen warriors, eyes burning like ghostly lanterns in the dark. The Gashadokuro, also known as Odokuro, emerges at 2 a.m., a ghostly hour where it roams with a menacing, clattering sound, Gachi Gachi. Its skeletal form strikes fear into the hearts of any unfortunate souls that cross its path. Stealthy when it wishes to be, this monster is as unpredictable as a cat stalking its prey. The Gashadokuro possesses a formidable array of powers, including invisibility and indestructibility, thanks to its bone-chilling composition. 
Shinto charms are said to provide some defense against its wrath, but facing a Gashadokuro is no small feat. Legend has it that the creature will relentlessly pursue its prey until its pent-up anger is released, causing its skeletal structure to crumple and collapse. Bakwas, also known as the King of Ghosts, Man of the Sea, or the Wildman of the Woods, is a prominent figure in Native American folklore, particularly among the Kwakwakawaku peoples of British Columbia. Associated with the souls of the drowned, Bakwas is said to inhabit the forest areas where they meet bodies of water, dwelling in invisible houses alongside other spirits of the drowned. According to legend, Bakwas is known to offer food to the living he encounters, such as salmon or berries. However, these offerings are cursed, disguised as wholesome foods but actually containing rot, maggots, snakes, or lizards. Those who consume them are doomed to become like Bakwas themselves. Described as skeletal with long hair, round eyes, and a pointed nose, Bakwas is believed to be the husband of Dzunukwa, a cannibal giant notorious for consuming children. Various accounts attribute Bakwas's origin differently, some suggesting he was once drowned himself, while others portray him as a lost warrior who transformed into a wild man after becoming lost in the woods. To honor the legend of Bakwas, many tribes carve intricate masks depicting his features, including arched eyebrows, round eyes, and a long nose. These masks are often worn during ceremonial dances, with the dancer symbolizing Bakwas's shy nature by holding their hands in front of their face. Despite his shy demeanor, Bakwas is said to crave companionship, albeit under ominous circumstances. Rokurokubi initially appears as an ordinary human, often a woman during the day. However, during the night, they undergo a supernatural transformation. The defining feature of the Rokurokubi is its ability to stretch its neck to extraordinary lengths. In its extended form, the Rokurokubi's neck can reach several feet, allowing it to peer into windows or hover over sleeping victims. Despite the elongation, the Rokurokubi's body remains normal. Rokurokubi are typically harmless during daylight hours and may lead seemingly ordinary lives. However, at night, their unsettling abilities manifest. Some legends suggest that the transformation is involuntary and happens while the Rokurokubi is asleep. In other stories, the yokai may have control over when and how it stretches its neck. During its nocturnal activities, the Rokurokubi may engage in mischievous or malevolent behavior. Some tales depict them as harmless tricksters, enjoying the reactions of startled onlookers. Others portray them as more sinister, using their elongated necks to spy on or frighten unsuspecting victims. Some tales explain the yokai's condition as a curse, punishment, or inherited trait, while others attribute it to supernatural possession. Picture a floating disembodied woman's head, organs and entrails cascading from its neck, twinkling like a ball of flame in the night. It's the stuff of nightmares and a thorny challenge for even the most seasoned monster hunters. In its origin story, the Penangalan dances on the line between the supernatural and the human. It's not your typical undead ghoul, but rather a witch who decided she needed a bit of vinegar therapy. To transform into this heady menace, a woman practices black magic during a ritual bath in vinegar, head submerged. Come nightfall, this creature takes flight, its organs soaked in vinegar for that perfect fit when it rejoins its body come sunrise. Now, the Penangalan has a taste for the exotic. Pregnant women and young children are its delicacies. Men, fortunately or unfortunately, are spared its nocturnal horrors. But fear not. Hunters of old devised ingenious ways to outsmart this vinegar-drenched fiend. Thorns are your first line of defense. Scatter the sharp leaves of Mengkwang, a local plant, and watch as the Penangalan gets caught in its own demise. Glass shards atop walls serve a dual purpose, deterring both the creature and earthly thieves. 
and for those expecting mothers, keeping scissors or beetle nut cutters under the pillow may prove a literal lifesaver. Now, if you're feeling more adventurous, you could opt for a DIY approach to annihilation. Pour broken glass into the neck cavity when the head's away, and voila! Organs severed, problem solved. Alternatively, sanctify the body, burn it, or somehow keep it from reattaching by sunrise. Easy as pie, right? And there you have it. If you enjoy our content, please like this video, share it with your friends, and subscribe to the channel. It means a lot. Thank you, and safe travels, my dear friends.